Hi, I'm John Barron from Google Research, and in this video I'll be presenting our work on MIP Nerf 360. Neural radiance fields are a very effective way to do view synthesis, and Nerf really excels in two constrained settings, which were explored in the first Nerf paper. These are synthetic objects without any background, viewed from all angles, which you can see on the left, and real-world scenes where the camera is always facing the same direction, which you can see on the right. This work is about how to deal with unbounded scenes. So we're focusing on scenes where there is a main object of interest in front of an elaborate and interesting background and where the camera rotates around the object. Here's a rendering from our model. So given a couple of hundred posed images of this scene, we're able to produce photorealistic renderings from unseen camera positions. We can also query this model to produce depth maps, which exhibit a lot of fine grained detail. And here's another rendering from our model on a different scene from our dataset. This is a dataset we collected ourselves of nine challenging indoor and outdoor scenes. And here's another rendering from one of the indoor scenes. Our model is based on NERF, which uses the weights of a coordinate-based MLP to model the volumetric density and color of a scene, and which uses a rendering model that looks a lot like ray tracing. We're building on top of a NERF extension called MIPNERF, which casts cones instead of rays and uses multivariate Gaussians to represent 3D volumes in the scene. This change lets MIPNERF deal with aliasing and scale more easily, but it doesn't solve all of the problems associated with large unbounded scenes. There are three major problems with trying to get MIPNERF to work well on unbounded scenes, and the three main contributions of this work are intended to address those problems. The first problem is in terms of representation. Unbounded scenes are, by definition, unbounded, but MIPNERF needs its inputs to be in a bounded coordinate space. To deal with this, we warp the MIPNERF Gaussians into a non-Euclidean space using a technique that looks a lot like an extended Kalman filter. The other problem with large scenes is that they're often very detailed. You can address this by making the neural network underlying MIPNERF much bigger, but this makes training painfully slow. So during optimization, we train a small proposal MLP to bound the geometry predicted by a large NERF MLP, which makes training about three times faster. Another problem is that in bigger scenes, 3D reconstruction becomes inherently more ambiguous. In practice, this results in a lot of artifacts. To fix this, we introduce a novel regularizer designed specifically for MIPNERF ray intervals. Let's talk about that first problem of parameterization. Here we have a toy flatland scene with three cameras. In MIPNERF, these cameras cast Gaussians out into the scene, and in a large scene, this results in Gaussians that are very far away from the origin and very elongated. This is a problem for MIPNERF, which requires a bounded coordinate space and works best when Gaussians are somewhat isotropic. To fix this, we define a warp that smoothly maps all coordinates outside of a radius 1 ball into a radius 2 ball. This warp is designed to counteract the nonlinear spacing of the MIPNERF Gaussians. To apply this contraction to MIPNERF Gaussians, we use what is basically an extended Kalman filter. This lets us warp our Gaussians such that an unbounded scene is contained inside a ball of radius 2, and this non-Euclidean space is where we're going to represent the inputs to our MLP. To understand our online distillation approach, we first need to review how MIPNERF's training and sampling procedure works. In MIPNERF, first you define a set of evenly spaced coarse intervals along a ray, and you can think of these as like the endpoints in a histogram. The Gaussians corresponding to each interval are pushed through an MLP, as shown here, which produces what is basically a colored histogram with weights W and colors C. These weights and colors are then averaged to produce an alpha composited color for that pixel. Then, those weights are resampled to get a new set of intervals that are clustered around wherever there's content in the scene. This resampling can be done multiple times, but we're just showing one resampling here for convenience. Those intervals are pushed through the MLP to get a set of weights and colors, and those are used to produce the color of the pixel. MIPNERF is optimized by just minimizing our reconstruction loss between all rendered pixel values and the true pixel color taken from the input images. Only the fine color is used to render the final image, which shows how wasteful this process is. The only reason the coarse rendering is supervised at all is to help guide the sampling of the fine histogram. This observation motivated our model's training and sampling procedure. We start with a set of evenly spaced histogram intervals, and we push them through a proposal MLP to produce a set of weights, but no colors. Those weights are then resampled, and again, this procedure can be done multiple times, but we're just showing one resampling for convenience. 
The last set of intervals produced by this proposal MLP are then pushed through a MLP that behaves exactly the same as in MIPNERF, which we'll call the NERF MLP. And this gives us a set of weights and colors, and those are used to render the pixel color. We're going to supervise this one rendering to be close to the true pixel color taken from an input image. And instead of supervising the proposal MLP to accurately reconstruct the image, we're going to supervise its output weights to be consistent with the output weights from the NERF MLP. This setup means that we can have a very small proposal MLP, which we query very often, and a very large NERF MLP, which gets queried relatively few times. To make our model work, we need a loss function that encourages histograms with different bin endpoints to be consistent with each other. To illustrate this, on the left we constructed a true 1D distribution, and on the right we have two histograms of that true distribution. Because these two histograms are both summaries of the same underlying distribution, we can make some strong assertions about how they must relate to each other. For example, the weight of that bin highlighted above must be no more than the sum of the bin weights that overlap with it in the histogram below. With this fact, we can construct an upper bound on the weights of one histogram using the weights of the other histogram shown here. Again, if these two histograms are both summaries of the same underlying true distribution, this bound must hold. So during training, we impose a loss on the histograms produced by the proposal MLP and the NERF MLP that penalizes any excess mass that violates this bound, shown here in red. By doing this, we encourage the proposal MLP to learn what is effectively an upper envelope on the volumetric scene density learned by the NERF MLP. The last component in our model, which addresses the ambiguity problem, is a straightforward regularizer on each ray's histogram. We're just minimizing the weighted absolute distance between all points along the ray, and this encourages each histogram to be as close to a delta function as possible. This double integral shown here is not easy to evaluate, but we can derive a nice closed form that is trivial to compute. Here we're ablating those three model components one by one with the ablation shown on the right. Ablating the parameterization we use results in very blurry backgrounds. Not only are the renderings blurry, but you can see from the depth maps that distant areas don't have a lot of detail. Ablating our distillation technique uniformly lowers quality everywhere. You can see a lot of flickering and thin structures are quite a bit worse. Though this component's main purpose is to accelerate optimization, which it does by a factor of about three. Ablating our regularizer results in lots of these floater artifacts. These artifacts can sometimes be hard to see in a still image and aren't penalized much by single image metrics, but they're very distracting when looking at a video and are especially visible when we look at depth. Here we're comparing our model against three of the baselines used in the paper. First, we'll compare against MIPNERF, where we've scaled Euclidean space down to deal with MIPNERF's requirement of a bounded coordinate space. MIPNERF struggles with this scene for the reasons we've described and produces blurry renderings in the foreground and background. Next, we compare against NERF++, which is a NERF variant that is specifically designed to handle these unbounded scenes. NERF++ does a much better job than MIPNERF on the background, but it still doesn't achieve the same accuracy and realism as our model. Here we compare against stable view synthesis, which was the top performing non-NERF baseline we evaluated our dataset on. Some renderings from SVS look very realistic, but it's prone to severe failure modes that result in very blurry renderings. These failure modes seem to occur because SVS relies on a proxy geometry that's produced by call map, which you can see here, and that geometry can sometimes be accurate. 
Our model doesn't require any geometry as input and produces more realistic depth maps than call map. Here we're comparing against those same three baselines on a different scene from our dataset. And that's it. Thanks for watching.